much for uh, coming here the last afternoon of the, the last day. Um, so I will be talking about modeling the origin of polis, uh, specifically in the case of uh, Anatolia. And particularly I'm interested in how to move from computation uh, from conceptual approaches to computational approaches. So, and more specifically, um, how to translate conceptual models in uh, a computer model, in this case, an agent-based model. I will not particularly talk about agent-based modeling as such, or I will not show you any particular agent-based modeling, but I will show you the first steps towards constructing such a model. Um, so I will first start with a general feel, giving you a general feel of what the polis in Anatolia is about. Very briefly go into how um, to design a model that is tailored to capture this uh, phenomenon. Um, talk about the three main conceptual pillars of that model and then how to move that towards a computational context and then very briefly show you an outline of um, an agent-based model that will be in development uh, in the future and that I hope to uh, extend as much as possible. So when talking about the polis, the polis as such is a Greek wor word and a Greek concept, means city. And um, so there has been a major uh, research project um, based at the Copenhagen University, Copenhagen Polis Center, that basically did an inventory of Polis communities throughout the Mediterranean. And this is a snapshot of that data. In essence, the, the Polis is a phenomenon that has been observed throughout many regions of the Mediterranean world, but is focused very much on the Aegean world, so Greek mainland, uh, the islands, and the west coast of Asia Minor. Um, the map on the left that you see is the map focusing on the Polish communities identified by this project. And that project focused very much on the archaic and Achaemenid or classical periods. Um, when we plot the settlements identified as Polis specifically for Anatolia in Hellenistic times, that's what you see on the right. And we see that also in the interior, there are a lot of polis communities that are developing in Anatolia. And we're talking about what a polis actually is. And I want to illustrate that um, by the hand of two cases. So on the one hand, Byzantepe, and on the other hand, Sagalassos. I should have mentioned, by the way, that we're located here in the southwestern part of Anatolia. So these two communities originated more or less at the same time in the 15th century BCE. And we have a lot more information about these early phases for Byzantepe, just for the reason that the, this community was abandoned um, somewhere at the early 2nd century uh, BC. Whereas at the same time, Sagalassos, which originated at the same time, was also very much a village community. So we have an impression, a, a cartoon impression uh, of the village uh, based on the archaeological evidence that we have. Um, but Sagalassos itself developed into a more um, monumental center right at the time when the Zendepe was abandoned, so around the late 3rd, early 2nd century BCE. And it's this transformation from Sagalassos which is an example of what in the scholarly research is considered polis formation. So you have the development of a new form of material culture, uh, monumental architecture, a form of social political organization and institutions that is being uh, developed. Um, territorial extension is a very common uh, criteria and development of local elites. So we can see very much or very clearly, of course, in the archaeological record, the difference between the um, architecture, um, whereas in Byzantine we're talking about stone um, base, uh, stone rubble bases um, finished with vernacular architecture. Um, in Sagalassos uh, at that time, we see the first development of monumental architecture. So it's this process that is basically the essence of what is considered a polis formation. Um, 
Now, if we want to capture that process in a model, then we have to first take into account look, what do we want to do. So a model in general has three main properties. It represents something, an entity of your interest or system of interest, whatever that may be. It is also always a simplification in the sense that no model can ever capture everything of the entity that you're interested in. You will always have to focus on certain things, certain key parameters and mechanisms that you think will give the essence of what it is that you're trying to model. And thirdly, you also need a purpose. You need to identify why you want to model something. So three questions, what, how, and why. The what I indicate at the beginning, I'm interested in modeling the origin and development of Polace communities in Anatolia. How I would like to do that is by focusing on three key properties, being fusion-fission cycles, urban scaling, and centrality. Um, why I want to do that? Well, there are many reasons why someone can go towards modeling as a, as a research tool. Um, I will talk about some of those reasons throughout this presentation in a bit more detail. Two things that I want to highlight here is that one, there is very much untapped potential of such computational approaches, whatever that may be, made up even uh, that can be an Asian-based model, doesn't have to be. Um, but classical archaeology is a field of archaeology where such models have been very much underrepresented. That alone is very interesting, but not necessarily sufficient to use models, not because it hasn't been done before that it's necessarily a good idea to do it. Um, but I would very much like to argue that it is a very good tool to start testing existing hypotheses and to start exploring the possibility space of certain dynamics. I will return to that. So starting with conceptual modeling, um, very basically, conceptual model is any model that is made from ideas or concepts. Very basic definition, of course. And in this case, I'm interested mainly, or in the first place, on settlement dynamics, the interactions within and between settlements. So I will focus on intra-community dynamics um, and on inter-community dynamics. These two are the main components. The first element I would like to highlight is that of fusion-fission cycles. And I draw this concept from the work of John Bindliff, who delivered uh, the keynote earlier at this, uh, at this uh, conference. And basically, what he saw in his model of polis formation in uh, Boeotia, in mainland Greece, is that in early Iron Age times, you had a di dispersed landscape habitation, so a number of communities spread out across the, uh, the landscape and throughout time these communities started to fill in the landscape so we see the emergence of new communities popping up throughout the landscape until at some point this landscape is pretty much filled up and then by classical times so more or less around the fifth century a bit earlier maybe we see the first emergence of so-called polis communities so where some of the existing communities, like here the, the triangle, triangles, um, started to grow in size, whereas other communities remained smaller, so the circles, they, they be, uh, became dependent villages, dependent on a, a bigger center, and others simply disappeared. And the, the explanation that John gave for this was the existence of certain of so-called fusion-fission cycles, so where there are dynamics that, or the interplay between dynamics encouraging the increase of group size versus dynamics encouraging the reduction of group sizes. So the um, idea was that um, certain elements such as um, the limits to information processing actually induced these kind of villages to split up as soon as the communities uh, started to grow too large. Um, some of these uh, elements have been addressed by earlier speakers as well, so I don't have to go too much detail. Um, 
But basically, the idea is that in order for some of these communities to start and grow, they needed to develop a certain form of social <coughs> organization. And that allowed some of them to incorporate other communities in fusion processes or to make them dependent in a hierarchy. Um, so one of the drivers of that process, as John uh, conceptualized it, was population growth. And the, um, the process of fusion fission cycles as such can help us to structure our data to see or to give us an overall framework of what we see in the data and interpret it, but it doesn't necessarily give an explanation of what happened. So I want to turn to a second element, which has been discussed in the first talk of this session in much more detail. So I'm very glad that I don't have to go too much uh, into detail there. I can just skip it and actually remain within my 15 minutes. Um, so basically there the idea is that population growth or population aggregation is one of the, ma the main societal drivers of development. Um, where basically, as you have more people within the same community, you have more interaction going on, you have um, more information being exchanged. Um, and this is a sort of conceptualization of communities as social reactors and uh, a process called energized crowding in a recent model by uh, Michael Smith. Um, and the interesting things about the, uh, or the interesting aspects of this model is that, as we heard earlier, it's not only something which is applicable to modern societies, it's also something that has been applied to ancient societies and it is something that spans the urban non urban divide. So it's something we also see in villages. So it's a very interesting concept to start working with if you want to model how cities developed out of villages so how this process um, emerged and you have these typical plots that i uh, don't have to explain at this point anymore so you have um, depending on so you have a, the comparison of one entity being population size to another entity of interest whatever that is and the relationship between those two entities can be either superlinear, linear, or sublinear. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail there. We heard uh, about that earlier. Um, one of these applications, and this has actually been discussed uh, by John Hansen in very in very detailed way in the first talk, is that as communities grow larger, you have more diversity in functions within a community. Now, if we look at that diversity of functions, not only on the level of this specific community, but of a general settlement pattern, then we see that these functions can also be spatially concentrated within the landscape. And this is the basic idea behind the, um, the theory of central place um, model developed by uh, Chris Thaler, um, which is very much based on a functional, uh, sorry, a qualitative um, uh, concentration of, uh, of, of functions within the network. Um, some more recent work has also stressed the aspect of quantitative um, uh, or the quantitative aspect of, of concentration of functions being that you don't just have these main five main uh, functions within the hierarchy. You also have the degree or the strength in which that each of these functions has a certain pulling power over the landscape. So this is what's been called the relative concentration of interaction and the, the, those actually constitute a form of pulling factor for potential centrality within the landscape. So this is a very much more nuanced perspective uh, than that of the, the original central place theory model. And this actually allows you to start, um, to start modeling some of the drivers behind the processes that we see. Um, so, one thing that I should add, um, one of the things that, oh, really, okay, I will skip it then. Um, <laughs> so there, there is, there are a lot of steps that are included in yeah, build. Extra two minutes. <laughs> great, well, always helps uh, to include references to the organizers. Great. <laughs> 
Anyway, so the different steps of, a, of building a model. Um, so you have nine steps based over, uh, on three phases, just to show you that building a model is not just about coding and uh, writing codes and then running that. There is a whole set of steps uh, going uh, or coming before that, and there's also steps following it. Um, so I will not talk into de in detail about the technical phase here. It's mostly the conceptual phase that I'm interested in. Um, so and one way to start working on building an Asian-based model is to uh, work with the ODD protocol, so the, um, which is a standardized documentation protocol that allows you to describe the main features of your model and how it works, and basically also, also allows you to structure your thoughts. And one of the things, so I'm not going to go into detail, I had just the purpose of the model that I highlighted, and one of the purposes or the main purpose of the model is to study the emergence of policy communities out of the, the dynamics and the concepts that I just described. And one thing that an Asian-based model does really well is that it allows you to study the non-linear dynamics that emerge from historically contingent actions of agents interacting in space. Um, and basically, in the original model posited by Windliff, the reasons why certain communities developed into polys, whereas others, others did not, was left very much to the aspect of contingency. There was, it could have been that some communities were a bit, were a bit larger, that some were more predisposed towards uh, development of social organization. But in the end, it was contingency that we could not capture within the archaeological record, which is true. Um, but that's where I think an Asian-based model allows you to try and make sense of that contingency in a bit more detail. It, tries, you ca it allows you to go and look into the reasons behind or the drivers behind a certain process and start to piece out more in more detail how this process actually uh, could have worked. So I will skip that, skip that. Um, just in more detail, you have one of the elements in building a model is, is constructing a process overview. So focusing on the central elements, um, which allows you to, to use uh, the, the outputs of one process as input of another and also identify uh, potential feedback loops between processes. Um, that's already in more detail um, how to implement that and which um, existing formulas can be used um, so that allows you to focus on certain aspects in each of these processes and how they relate to each other. I will not go into detail there. Um, one uh, element that that has been applied is, for example, how to develop origin of polys as a, a, a central node in a network. And this is something which has been done by Wilson and Rill in 1987 already uh, in the so-called retail model, which was actually applied to the case of polis, uh, or origin of polis in the first place. Um, so these are all existing elements that can be used to basically to, to formalize and to, to fill in the model itself. Um, so also the, the network formation is something. Um, so the very basic layer of the model is just an, an initialization of polities and the territory divided by uh, Voronoi diagrams on, on which multiple layers of more detail will be added later on. Um, so this is then used as the, basic, the basic foundation of further work. Um, where I will start implementing both micro and macro scale dynamics. In the micro uh, scale, there will be the, the incorporation of in more detail <laughs> scaling and how scaling works and what the output of that uh, process is. Um, there is the element that, um, that these communities, especially these policy communities in Anatolia are not necessarily autonomous units, so they are, especially in Hellenistic times, incorporated in more overarching frameworks of the competing Hellenistic kingdoms. So the role of these kings in local dynamics is something which at this point is very much left out, but it's something that I would like to conclude, uh, include later on. And finally, there is at the moment no element of human environment interactions taken into account. So it's a very much spatially abstract model, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I don't intend to incorporate a realistic GIS layer um, in the model, but to have a bit more of a uh, 
sense of an environment in which you can exploit energy um, and then use that energy to fuel your, the dynamics that we see in these settlements is something that will be included. And as soon as I develop this model more, I will make it all available on GitHub. Thank you very much.